wherever you happen to be in the world. Um, I know people are tuning in from all over the place. Um, and thank you to uh, the Stanton Village for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, so my name is indeed uh, Vinko, uh, and I'm that, uh, I'm that weird uh, friend that is really, really, really into bugs. Hashtag Facebook. Facebook. Um, I go crazy about bugs. Uh, I like putting them on my face. I like doing research on them. And uh, if you can see from the video, uh, my, my screen behind me, I've got a bunch of bugs on my wall as well. So I am originally from Cordoba in Argentina. Uh, this is a very dry, arid region and one that I absolutely love. Um, this is what my back, backyard looks like down there. Um, it's just beautiful rolling hills with, with low, low grasses, um, not very many trees. And I absolutely adore this landscape. Um, and I think it's no surprise that uh, throughout my career, I have now ended up working in the Canadian Arctic that uh, in many parts looks somewhat like this. Lots of very low, shallow rolling hills with short grasses uh, and lots of rocky outcrops. So for me, um, this here is, is paradise uh, back home in Argentina. And I'm so glad to have found a similar paradise um, where I currently am. Um, so I actually immigrated to uh, Canada uh, quite a while ago, uh, and I moved to Ottawa, uh, Canada's capital, where I did my undergrad at the very beautiful University of Ottawa. Um, and I started doing research quite early because in my first year as an undergrad student, I started volunteering in a lab um, where uh, the, the PI and graduate students all studied um, pollination ecology. And some of the projects I worked on were looking at um, the behavior of solitary uh, bees. And I'm sure you've heard of bee hotels. Um, you might be able to buy them in certain big stores. Um, but this is what uh, the bee hotels that we use uh, for our research look like. It's just a couple blocks of wood with holes drilled in and wrapped in, in burlap. Um, nothing too complicated. You can make this at home for five dollars. Uh, better that than going to Walmart and spending forty dollars for a bee hotel. Um, and one of the cool things about these uh, these trap nesting boxes is that we put little paper straws and we can extract the paper straws and cut open little windows to see what's inside. Uh, and so right here this pearl-like object is actually a bee egg and it belongs to this bee which is a mason bee in the genus Osmium. And you can see here that we paint it with little colors uh, so we can, can keep track of the individuals. Um, and uh, while doing my undergrad, I also did a bunch of research on this little plant here. This is Lathyrus lansweridii. It's a mountain uh, pea vine. It's just a cute little pea. Uh, it's not edible like, most, like many other peas. Um, it, will, it will cause a lot of harm. Uh, but it's just a really, really beautiful uh, flower. And so I spent a big part of my undergrad uh, doing research on bees uh, and pollinators and plants. Um, but today I'm actually a graduate student at McGill University. Um, but more specifically, I work out of the Lyman Entomological Museum. Uh, this is a museum that belongs to McGill University and is one of the largest insect collections in Canada. We have rows and rows and rows and rows of cabinets uh, that contain almost three million specimens. And uh, these are some of my favorites. Uh, they're just some very weird and wonderful little creatures. Um, the, top, uh, the top left, this butterfly here, this is actually a Xerxes butterfly. Um, and if you work in conservation uh, or, or you've got an interest in insects or invertebrates, uh, you might have heard about the Circe Society which is named after this butterfly, um, which has now gone extinct. Um, and, you know, I think it's very special that we have this specimen in our museum. Uh, many of these other specimens you see here, I don't know what species there are, um, but I just think they're weird and wacky. And, and, you know, why wouldn't I fall in love with insects when, when they're so strange? Um, so that's a little bit about my background and, and where I come from. But I should really move on to my actual talk. 
uh, and the actual science I'm going to talk about. Um, so today I've titled my talk, The Value of Networks uh, in Arctic Plants, Pollinators and Beyond. Now, when I say Arctic, most people think of this. And I know that's true because this is the first image that shows up when you Google Arctic. We, we typically imagine a very desolate, very cold, um, very dead uh, type of landscape with not a lot going on. But in reality, the Arctic can look like this. In the summertime, uh, once the snow has melted, flowers will just bloom like crazy and can carpet the landscape. Uh, while my time in the Arctic, I remember being just amazed at seeing so many different colors just coming and going throughout the flowering season. And, you know, this is, this is uh, partly why I think the Arctic, it's, it reminds me a lot of home, it reminds me a lot of Argentina. And it was such a surprise seeing so much life that I just wanted to learn more and spend as much time there as I could. Now, those are the plants, but when we think about pollinators, usually the first thing that will come to mind are the bees and the butterflies. Um, but that needn't be the case. And actually, in the Canadian Arctic, flies are the most important pollinators. Um, and by a long shot, over 91% of pollinating species in the Arctic are flies. And that includes all those mosquitoes that, that we absolutely hate. Um, the rest of the pollinators are composed of the butterflies, the bees, and actually a handful of spider species that like to hang around in flowers. And so if we take a look at the plants and the pollinators together, we can create something called a plant pollinator network. And that's a bipartite or two mode uh, system uh, in which you've got two players in this system. You've got the pollinators and the plants. Um, and we can model this network in a way that the, the individuals in each of those groups um, only interact with individuals of other groups, but not with individuals within their groups, um, such that the bees don't interact with the bees and the flowers don't interact with the flowers. Uh, now, if there's any ecologists in the audience right now, uh, you'll know that that is uh, an absolutely blasphemous thing to say because flowers and plants do interact with other flowers and plants. Um, but when it comes to pollination, um, it's, it's totally okay to model it in such a simple way. And there are many, many, many different ways in which we can describe the properties of this network. Um, for example, we can talk about the net of a network. And this relates to how many um, generalist species interact with other generalists versus specialists interacting with generalists or specialist species. And, um, you know, it might be difficult to understand this concept in the terms of bees and or flies and plants, but think about the social networks around you. Um, perhaps you're a person that is a specialist in that you have um, just a few very, 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 very good and very, very close friends. Or you might be a generalist. You could be someone with many, many, many friends that you aren't super close to. And so that's uh, how we might think about nestedness in these networks. Another property of these networks is called modularity. And that's the uh, grouping of interactions um, such that Species in one group, so let's say the flies, interact with species in the other group, let's say a certain set of flowers, but they kind of all interact together and they, they don't interact with species outside of that group. Um, and you can think about this in your own social network um, because you exist in a bunch of different modules. So, for example, uh, you have your family that you interact a lot with. Um, you've got um, uh, your coworkers, you've got your group of friends, perhaps you're part of a knitting club or, for, or a photography club. These are all um, modules or groupings within your social network. And the people that you interact with in your uh, knitting club aren't necessarily the same people that you interact with at work or with your best friends or with your family. And so that's what modularity means. Now, 
there are many other ways we can describe uh, networks. There's connectance and linkage level and size and density. Um, and I could go on forever on that, but I won't. Um, but I do want to talk briefly about the robustness of ecological networks. And because I'm talking about plants and pollinators, uh, I'm going to kind of frame it in, in that, uh, with that perspective. Um, so let's say you've got a, um, a very robust network. This is a network that can take uh, a lot of damage. So for example, species could disappear uh, or invasive species could appear. And um, as, as, as these networks are damaged, they're pretty robust. And, and they don't collapse. So for example, imagine a network where we have an increase in plant extinction. More and more plants are disappearing. In the robust network, it takes a lot of plant extinction before we see a drop in the number of pollinators surviving. But on the other hand, in an unstable network, it doesn't take a lot of plant extinction to start seeing a drop uh, in the pollinators that survive. And so this concept of robustness is really important as we think about the future of, um, of any kind of ecological uh, network within the context of climate change. Um, now there's many, many different ways that networks can change. Um, for example, networks can rewire uh, through time. Perhaps a pollinator chooses to start pollinating a different kind of flower. Um, another way that these networks change through time is through the effect of species turnover. Um, and that's this concept of species appearing and disappearing, whether that's um, pollinators going extinct or new plants showing up, this kind of species turnover results in changes to the network. Now, this is all really, um, uh, really interesting um, at a very, at a very, you know, ivory tower kind of level. Um, but it's also a very pressing thing to start thinking about and researching because we are seeing big changes in the Arctic. So here's a map of the vegetative index of Canada uh, or North America. And vegetative index is basically a measurement of the greenness of a landscape. It basically says um, uh, how much uh, photosynthetic activity is going on. And we can see that in the northern parts here of Canada, we've had the greatest change. Uh, over the last 30 years of photosynthetic activity. Now, some people might argue, well, okay, this is just because uh, plants are, are getting bigger. Uh, and yes, that is, that is the case. But there's also an issue of new plant species moving northwards. As temperatures have in, been increasing, we're seeing all sorts of plant species move up uh, higher in the latitudes, but we're not seeing a similar change in the pollinators, where the lower range limit of pollinators is moving northwards, but the uh, higher range limit of our po pollinators are not moving northward. And so we're kind of being set up in this situation where we're going to have plants in the north, North America or the north of Europe uh, that don't have the associated pollinators that they necessarily depend on. Now, um, not a lot of research has been done on plants and pollinators in the Canadian Arctic. Um, one study done in the 70s came out of Lake Hazen. There was another study about uh, five years ago out of uh, uh, Alexander Fjord. Uh, and a bit of work has been done out of Greenland. Um, but I decided to do my work out of Cambridge Bay on Victoria Island. And so thinking about pollinators, thinking about these networks, I had a bunch of questions I wanted to ask about those uh, groups of organisms in the Arctic. First, I wanted to know, well, which insects pollinate which plants? Which are the flies that we see visiting plants the most often? I also wanted to describe those properties of the plant pollinator network. Next, this modularity, link, link, uh, linkage level, and connectance, among other things. I also want to know, how do these different things, whether it's the properties of the network or the actual species in the network, how do they differ between two different kinds of habitats, a wet and a dry habitat? And I'm really curious to know what's going on across a flowering season. Um, so how do these same things change from spring to summer to fall? Which, by the way, in the Canadian Arctic is a very short time. Um, so I went up to Cambridge Bay on Victoria Island in Nunavut, Canada. 
Uh, and I was based out of this brand new shiny research station called the Canadian High Arctic Research Station. And I decided to set up six uh, research plots, um, six, uh, sorry, 12, six dry plots were set up along the road that goes from Cambridge Bay to Ovayuk Territorial Park. Uh, and I set up six uh, wet, uh, or six plots in a wet habitat along the road that goes from Cambridge Bay to Long Point. And this is what those two habitats look like. And at first glance, they look similar, but you can see that the dry habitat is very rocky, uh, tends to be on a slope, um, and there aren't that many plants. Uh, there's lots of little compact, almost shrub-like plants. Uh, whereas the, the wetter habitats um, are far more, are, are covered in far more plants. They're really dominated by um, grasses uh, and sedges. Sedges being a group of plants that are very, very similar to grasses. Um, and they're also dominated by a lot of willow species. Now, you might think about a weeping willow, which is a giant tree, but this here, this little bush, is also a willow species. And it's only about a foot high. Um, so the Arctic has some very interesting, interesting plants. Um, so uh, what I did is I went up to these sites and I basically watched the flowers and caught pollinators when they were visiting a flower. Um, and what I did was I sampled when it was warm enough, so the temperature was above five degrees Celsius, wasn't too windy and it wasn't raining. Um, I sampled these uh, sites twice a day for an hour, one hour, and I usually went back to them every four days. And I, um, uh, I sampled only pollinators when I saw them coming into contact with the reproductive structures of a plant. So if a fly was just resting on a petal, that didn't count as a pollinator for me. So uh, this is my coworker, Jessica. And what we did is we, we captured the pollinators and put them into vials. Um, now for the bumblebees, uh, if we had caught a queen bumblebee, we would always uh, photograph her and release her because we don't want to kill a queen and therefore kill an entire colony. Um, and the other thing we did is we set up these one by 25 meter long um, uh, transects where we counted all of the open flowers in those uh, plots to see how much food was available to the pollinators. And so uh, over a summer, uh, I ended up collecting 2,346 specimens uh, visiting 23 different species. And in all, I recor recorded over 4,000 individual interactions. Um, and so this is a pretty good data set because I know exactly which fly was visiting which plant. And so just briefly, if I take my data and, and create a plant pollinator diagram like the one before, um, we can see that there's some interesting patterns. So up above in blue are the pollinators, which I've grouped into butterflies, wasps, flies, and bumblebees. And below in green are different uh, genera or different, um, yeah, different genera of plant species. Um, and one thing that's kind of interesting to note here is that the really small insects, things like, or small bodied insects, things like butterflies, wasps, and flies, tended to visit flowers that are open and kind of face upwards. Whereas the bumblebees, which are very large bodied insects, tended to visit closed uh, flowers. Um, and this hints to the presence of something called a pollination syndrome. And um, don't worry about what exactly pollination syndrome is, but I'll give you a couple examples. Um, whenever you find red sort of trumpet flower, trumpet shaped flowers, they tend to only be visited by hummingbirds. White trumpet-shaped flowers tend to be visited by moths. And of course, very stinky, very smelly, or, or uh, flowers that look like they're rotting flesh tend to be visited by flies. And so these are examples of these pollination symptoms. Um, so looking back here, we can see that in yellow, we've got the small-bodied flies visiting those open, upwards-facing flowers, whereas the bees are generally uh, pollinating or visiting those closed forward-facing flowers. Um, and I, th I think for the interest of time, I'm going to skip a little bit. I don't know how much I'm talking. Um, but uh, what you can see here is that um, when we take all of our insects uh, that I've identified and, and divide them by the two types of habitats, 
we can see some differences. Um, so I'll translate some of these names for you. Uh, Muscadet are the big housefly-like flies. Um, and so they tend to be the dominant groups of uh, pollinating insects in both the wet and dry habitats. But an interesting difference is that in the drier habitats, we have way more bumblebees than we do in the wetter habitat. And this could be for a bunch of different reasons, primarily because honeybees, or sorry, bumblebees uh, build their nests in cavities under the ground. There's no, there aren't very many cavities under the ground in the wet habitats because they're all flooded with water. Um, and if we look at the plants uh, in these two habitats, you can also see a difference. Um, the drier habitats had way more flowers than the wetter habitats. But there's also a difference in the composition. Salix up here, these four blocks in yellow and orange, these correspond to those willows. There are way more willows in the wetter habitats than there are in the drier habitats. And um, just uh, qualitatively speaking, if we look at the two network diagrams, um, this is what it looks like in the wet habitat. And don't worry about uh, the details of this. It's, it's a complex diagram, which even I haven't uh, fully comprehended quite yet. Um, you know, one of the things we can see is that the willows tend to be pollinated by a whole bunch of different groups. Same thing with rosaceae. Rosaceae is the family of flowers that includes um, uh, the roses and the little white mountain havens, uh, which I showed you a picture of earlier. Um, these two tend to be visited by many, many, many different uh, pollinators. Um, and we can kind of see a similar pattern where in the dry habitats, the rosaceae are visited by a ton of pollinators. Whereas the fabaceae, which are the beans, um, they tend to primarily be visited by only one group of pollinators, and those are the bumblebee. And that's the case for the dry habitat. Um, now, we can simplify these diagrams to really compare them um, by doing uh, ordination. And ordination basically just takes all of this data and in a very large multidimensional space, starts rotating it and squishing it and rotating and squishing it until we end up with a 2D diagram. And so if I take all six of my sites from the dry habitat and all six habit, uh, sites from the wet habitat, we can see that they form two very separate groups. Um, and this indicates that the sets of interactions between the two um, are quite different. Uh, and so if we think about the implications that, that uh, if we think about the implications for these networks, um, we might start to think uh, that these two, uh, that these plant pollen networks and the two habitats might react differently uh, to, to changes in the environment. Um, we might suspect that the wet habitats might be a little bit more robust. Um, although they had fewer flowers, they had greater diversity of flowers. They also had greater diversity of pollinators. Whereas the drier habitats uh, had a lower diversity of both groups. And as the climate in the Arctic continues to change, the Arctic might get drier and drier. If these wet habitats start to dry out a little bit, they can transition perhaps into the drier habitats. But what we now see as a dry habitat, the, the landscape might just get too dry for the plant species that live there. And if that's the case, as we see this extinction in plants, we might start to see a precipitous drop in those pollinators. Um, and so to kind of go wrapping up, um, you know, networks are, are really, really interesting, uh, particularly when we talk about uh, plants and pollinators, um, but they're also very, very, very complex. Um, and so they can be hard to understand, but absolutely worthwhile. Um, and the most important thing to know about uh, ecological networks is that it's, it's those networks, it's those set of interactions that support all of the species present. Now, Moving a little bit away from the Arctic and plants and bugs, networks, uh, particularly social networks, are also super important. Um, and what we just learned about modularity and nestedness and the robustness of this network, these networks, apply to human social networks as well. Having a strong social network, 
that is resilient uh, to, to uh, outside forces can really help support um, all the different people that are part of this network. And I found this to be particularly true um, within the LGBT community. Um, like I said, I grew up in Argentina, uh, which is a, uh, a hyper Catholic country. Um, and I grew up in a very rural area where, where there wasn't a lot of people uh, that I could identify. There weren't a lot of people like me. And so getting to be a part of and learning about organizations such as Pride and STEM, 500 Queer Scientists, uh, Pride and Polar Research, and now the STEM Village, um, has really helped me become a lot more comfortable uh, in science as a queer individual. And just as these complex networks help support the species of plants and pollinators in the Arctic, um, these complex networks within the LGBT community have really helped uh, support me in feeling safe um, and in feeling like I have a lot to uh, contribute to the world. Um, and so I haven't been keeping too much track of time. I don't know if I'm short or not, but I will wrap up now. Uh, and I just want to thank Jessica Turgeon, uh, my field assistant, um, and I thank her for all her help in the field and both her emotional support. Um, my supervisor, Dr. Chris Buttle, who uh, has helped me out so much throughout my work, um, to some funding sources and other networks I'm a part of, and lastly, uh, to you. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and I am open to questions now. And if anybody's interested in science communication workshops, uh, send me a message. <laughs>